Hi, this is Pat Moorhead and a huge welcome to everybody to the 6.5 Summit 2023, four years running. We talking about the greatest things in technology, talking to the most influential leaders out there. This year, the theme is navigating trouble waters. And as we know, Daniel, what gets us through this? Innovation in technology. How are you doing, my friend? Four years. Who would have thought? I know. You know, we started this thing right before 2020, which obviously made a huge inflection to all things digital. Yeah. But as the analysts, th thinkers that were kind of ahead of the curve, we knew the trend line would be, how do we get information out quickly, right. put it out in front of the paywall, make it available for people, and talk to the innovators, the disruptors, the companies that are doing things, and leading the way. And Pat, this year, we all knew there was going to be some challenges. We saw yes. it coming. It wasn't a massive prediction to say, but for our audience that we've been focusing on innovation with, it's time to put these leaders in front of them and say, hey, how do we get through this? And with all these trend lines, with AI, with multi-cloud, with security, right. to put the, these leaders in front of them, hopefully an opportunity to learn so much here. Absolutely, we've had some incredible leaders uh, open up the 6.5 Summit, and we are so pleased to introduce Hawk Tan of Broadcom. Hawk, how are you? Good. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's just, it. I mean, you're a legend in this industry and the, the changes and the dynamicism uh, are, are incredible. I mean, what you've done on the hardware side and now what you've done on the software side is, is, is impressive. Thank you. So you heard my preamble. Sometimes Pat accuses me of, of going on a bit, <laughs> but, uh, but it's very exciting times, Hawk. You know, whether it has been the sort of cyclical nature of the chip industry, which of course uh, Broadcom is weathering, or it is the innovations in software, the security movements and people working on cyber, or even uh, AI and generative AI, which of course has become top priority for so many companies. We are seeing a year of very different macroeconomic conditions. We've got interest rates up. We've got inflation persistent. We're not sure if the rate cycle, the rate hike cycle is over yet. That means uh, future earnings are being impacted. That means some stocks have been able to weather, other companies not so much. I'd love to just get your broad take on the macro environment and how companies should be thinking about technology and innovation in, in this current market. Well, the way I look at this uh, and the business we are in is, well, is we're very fortunate in many ways, Broadcom I'm referring to, in the technology side of the industry. And what it does is, I think the business model we over the years have seen and have preferred to, to adopt is one that's kind of diff very different from the older economy. Put simply put, when we, go, when we look at a situation, an uh, economic uncertainty, macroeconomic uncertainty, as we are seeing today, the way we look at it is, this is to kind of take a longer term view. Now, we have to be mindful of short term risks, uh, very thoughtful about things that might change. But in the broader scheme of things, see technology, in my view, is an evolutionary process. People like to talk about disruptive. Frankly, I think it's less disruptive, it's really evolutionary. And w the way we look at it is, we should not be in technology captive to economic cycles. Yeah. So as we look at what uh, we're seeing, economic uncertainty now, we do not necessarily see spending in, towards technology in the global sector going down. It may pause but there still is a need, there still is increased consumption. So our way to drive through it is, we're basically mindful of certain, certain risks we're taking, but our model gives us some advantages, which I'll touch on in a second. We keep on innovating, we keep on designing for the next generation product cycles, because we know out, uh, beyond this down cycle, our customers will need a new generation of products because they need to give value to their customers. Uh, Broadcom has 60 years of innovation packed into it. Um, names like AT&T Bell Labs, 
uh, Hewlett Packard, LSI, and more, and obviously the innovations that you're bringing together today. And I want to want to hone on in on this evolutionary uh, thought here because you're right. A, a lot of the headlines get seem to get made out of this disruptive black and white. Uh, life is going to change tomorrow uh, on, on, on the planet. Can you talk about um, why adopting this mindset is, is better than, than maybe going for the black and whites of, of a revolution? Well, to start with fundamentally, people, society, do not adopt technology as fast as we like them to. It never happens. You know, it's people adopt technology, we all, yours truly included, adopt technology slowly, much slower than we like it to be, uh, we like to believe. Technologists will always say things will change overnight, never does. <laughs> and my customers behave the same way, and their customers, the customers of my customers, behave the same way. So from, give an example is this, you know, we just didn't, we just were the beneficiary of an announcement made by our largest customer, Apple, on a multi-year uh, partnership in providing chips and key components for 5G and other products. Congratulations, this, by the way. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. because we do have a very deep and lasting partnership with Apple. And did, didn't come out of uh, thin air. We have been work doing those chip components, the same components, uh, the same kind of components announced in this deal, in this recent announcement, since iPhone 4. <laughs> so you can imagine, now we're going towards I next year, iPhone 15. Oh, right. We've been there, generation after generation. It's an evolutionary process. It's not enough to be, when you, to be available to your customer. It's not enough you show up one day and give a product yes. that is the best of its kind. You have to be there again the following year and the following year. And they have to count on you being there. So it's not about just doing the best product at any point in time. It's being able to be around to provide them with a trend, with an evolution through multiple generations. Gosh, I'm, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, it's tremendous. And you know, it's funny, we had that conversation, uh, it was an episode or two back where we talked about sustainability, and he's talking about sustainable business. And that's a, a very important thing that we need to build things to last. And I really like, Hawk, how you talked about, you know, that technology never really changes the world overnight. Now it feels a little bit like that right now with generative AI, but I always say, you know, Google's been finishing my sentences in, 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 in Gmail for two years now. I mean, generative things have been happening in our lives. And then all of a sudden there's this inflection or a waterfall that comes over the edge and everyone's like, whoa, the whole world's changed. But yeah. these things do happen more gradually than most people tend to notice. And I think you're really able to take advantage of that. The other thing though that I think is very interesting about your approach in studying the business and spending some time analyzing it is how you define value. So in your in your annual in your annual shareholder meetings and your quarterlies, you talk a lot about delivering more value. Your MA strategy is about delivering value, your your partner strategy value. Talk a little bit about Broadcom's approach to value, because I think the the word can be interpreted differently by, by different stakeholders and shareholders in your community. How do you define it? How do you make sure you continue to deliver it and truly be a company that provides meaningful value to your customers, your ecosystem, your partners, and beyond? Well, I mean, for a technology company like us, the most obvious way we deliver value is what can we, uh, what technology what features, I mean, what, how do we make our, the, our customers' products better? And better in the sense that they can, whether it's cheaper, whether it's very often more feature rich, lower power, depending on how it is, it's all about delivering to what they need. So when I say we deliver technology, I would say, Really, we deliver products from core fundamental technology that meets the needs 
of our customers. And it varies depending on the end markets we are in. You know, and also it used to be speed, speed, speed. Today is speed weighted against power in right. today's environment. And so the same technology, the, the core technology we deploy goes towards products that meet what a customer needs. Uh, and to put it directly, our most important partner are really the customers because they are the ones who tell us what we need and we develop the, te uh, the technology and the products that addresses it and that's intended to create value that, a that any customer or set of customers of ours want in any end markets at any particular time. And it's about the ability to adapt and evolve as the customer evolves. And we do that, and we try to do that on a sustainable basis through multiple generations. Right. And that's what creates for us a sustainable business. And by doing that, creating that value, we basically, in a, in a, put it in a nutshell, monetize the technology we have for our shareholders. You know, it's, it's, I'm sure a lot of the viewers are fascinated at how pragmatic uh, the the approach is. I mean, essentially helping to make your customers customer more successful in some way, shape, or form, either, th either through the experience, either through uh, lowering costs, but at its fundamental, uh, and that is what value is, is all about that you've captured. Now, none of that is free, right? It takes a lot of R&D to make that happen. In fact, based on our numbers, I think, R&D has outpaced your revenue by 50% since uh, 2009, uh, which is phenomenal when a lot of people today are, are, are winding down R&D to even cut costs over time. Uh, the other thing, the other approach that you've taken is, is your R&D is an evolutionary approach uh, as well. And I'm curious, how does that evolutionary R&D approach affect your customers and your customers uh, and users. As I mentioned, indicated earlier, our ability to keep coming up with different uh, pro uh, product roadmap in any of the areas we focus on is extremely critical to our customers because the whole th the whole idea in that we all like to be in technology it never stays the same. And, you know, if we we have to keep progressing, customers want to keep progressing because they want to be able to add, create re, uh, val, a reason for coming up with better products, for coming up with more value to their own customers as we do. And one of the nice things about technology is it doesn't say, stay stagnant. And our ability to keep coming up one uh, ne next generation products is great. Having said that, not all products, not all end markets evolve at the same rates. Give a sense, right? Uh, the phone that we that we that we so ubiquitous, it changes every year. Our business with our largest North American customer, right. we come up with a new generation of products to adapt to what they want in uh, to, uh, to, uh, to attract their consumers. Every year, we come up with a new generation every 12 months. Then we talk about data centers. In networking, we, we come up with a new generation of switches every two, three years, steady speed, and our customers right. come to count on it. Now, they would tell us, frankly, if I can give, the, you know, today our switch goes at uh, basically 25 terab terabit per second, which is pretty fast. <laughs> they would tell me they would love to have 100 terabit per second tomorrow, but I know the ecosystem doesn't support it, right. nor necessarily do they have all the needs to be able to address it. So we know we will go from 25 to next generation, which will happen in 2024, 50 terabit per second, and it'll be another two more, four more years before we get to 100. But the ability to be very, to be counted on, to be able to deliver that trend or products is what I think makes us as valuable 
to our customers as the fact that we have the technology. So it's, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm, it's timing, right? It's timing it right and not going for the latest shooting star or fad that's out there. It's just sticking to it on a consistent basis, hammering, hammering away at it. And from a resource allocation standpoint, that's, that's optimal. Yeah, you know, we've seen a lot of different models and mixes, but I think the longer term tends to tell the good, the best story, meaning that, you know, you can get it right once, but companies that tend to get it right over many <laughs> decades tend to have some things that they've learned along the way. And what I'm hearing here is durability, you know, in, in the strategy, Hawk, and, and you're showing a lot of that because the results have been consistent, persistent, you could even say. Um, you're in the process of a pretty big deal, uh, VMware. And I'm sure our audience, this is something they're gonna wanna hear from you about. Um, VMware, you know, I, I've heard you on the record. You've said, you know, they have some very, very good capabilities to help bring the multi-cloud to its potential. But you've also said there's a ways to go. And the company has, I think VMware made a billion dollar R&D commitment. You actually came out and said you would like to put another two billion towards R&D to bring the multi-cloud to life. Everyone out there wants to hear, share a little bit about a, you know, what you can about how the deal is progressing. And then of course, you know, with these big investments, kind of what do you see coming out of this deal? You know, presuming it gets done, what's next? That's a very good question. And first of all, you know, Broadcom has gone through, it has a model of acquiring technology, acquiring assets. Yeah which has very good technology. Because we are a bottom line technology company. The difference we think is our ability to deploy that technology in terms of creating very successful business models. And VMware fits that model perfectly. I mean, they are first and foremost in a very proven and rapidly growing market, still even in that stage. And what's that market? It's really about attracting, it's about enabling application workloads to run in data centers. That is it, run as efficient as possible in data centers. And that's a big market. Today, it's like $400 billion. Enterprise market between on-prem and in the public cloud. Now VMware started 20 years ago and it has the technology. It, came, it was one of the earliest companies to come up with technology that enables, uh, basically, a vir and enable virtualization, virtualization of hardware. Started with computing hardware. Why? It enables workloads to be run so much easier and at much less expensively. They were earliest, very successful in compute. The trouble is things change. Today, we talk about a cloud environment. What does a cloud environment mean? It means you run, not just computing virtualized, you run an entire data center. Computing, storage, networking, management, all on virtualized uh, cloud, uh, a software environment, what you call software-defined data center. Well, VMware is, uh, has been overtaken by the public cloud companies, the hyperscales today. You go into, uh, into the public cloud environment, you have a totally very elastic, very resilient uh, virtual environment. But VMware has not been as successful being able to deploy its technology into enterprises. Not in any scale, in not in any scale on a virtualized data center. So what we're coming in to basically uh, address is simply this. Standalone VMware doesn't have the scale, the financial wherewithal to make the kind of investments to be able to create that dream of creating a cloud environment for enterprises on-prem, just as they get it in a public cloud. And, for, and you, you hit it right on. They're investing, but inadequately. 
And what we propose to do is invest in two directions. One is uh, increase R&D by a billion dollars a year to basically make their products, the full stack of products, much more easy to consume, much more easy to use and operate. And the second part which you, is you can't do it on your own. You need to create an ecosystem. Right. You need to create partners. Is to, is to invest additional billion dollars a year to create, to train, certify professionals who can deploy, who can use, who can practice on VMs, VMS uh, virtualized products. That's what we foresee, uh, see ourselves doing as soon as we are able to in closing this deal. And if you do that, what you create on-prem among the enterprises is private cloud, which also enables that uh, workloads, application workloads running on the prem to go hybrid, public cloud, and back again. It's really to create that, you create that multi-cloud environment that you're talking about. And that's the long-term uh, plan uh, we have for VMware, but it's a journey and something that will right. take us a few years to achieve. Hawk, there's multi-cloud is one of my favorite topics uh, that I'm talking with enterprises or uh, other people out there in the industry. And the great news is we have arrived at the point that multi-cloud is accepted, if nothing else, because all Fortune 500 companies have multiple IS providers. Uh, what I'm really excited about with Broadcom energizing VMware is the ability to solve the problems that those enterprises have because of all the resources that they're putting in, in essentially stovepipes. So uh, I'm excited about this, uh, the enterprise is, is excited about this, and quite frankly, it's going to require a company who's more Switzerland who can go between the public cloud vendors, can go uh, between the on-prem uh, uh, companies out there. So known challenge, and I think right now with the extra added investment that Broadcom can bring to VMware, an acceleration of that capability and the digestibility of that for, for enterprises. So I'm excited about that. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, let's, I mean, it wouldn't be uh, a high-tech conversation yeah. if we didn't talk a little bit uh, about AI, okay? Oh, of course. <laughs> right? And I know we've talked about evolution uh, versus revolution, but I think we can all agree that uh, we're not talking about NFTs, which was clearly a fad, okay? But also, on the other side, AI is not something that's new. In fact, you go to the early days of AI algorithms, they're from the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, and then we had AI followed by machine learning and deep learning, and now here we are with generative AI. A lot of the hype has been driven by the consumer applications, okay? And at the back end, I mean, there's a lot of processing that goes on there. Some have talked about a 10x increase in what it takes to train a generative AI I model. But aside from consumer applications, what other type of benefits with generative AI have you been thinking about or, or maybe talking to your customers about, maybe enterprise capabilities of this? Well, that is, that's a very, very interesting topic and one can approach it in a couple of ways. And you're right, a lot of the hype today is on consumer applications, right? Write poems to your wife, <laughs> girlfriend, get GP, chat GPT to do it for you just like that because they have a database, it's well trained, but you got to go sign up and go to the cloud to do that. Right. Now, if you're an enterprise, and if you're particularly, say, your bank, and you want to get employees to write, uh, you know, to do certain, uh, create certain, uh, run certain models, and you don't have it on-prem, you want to go to uh, uh, Google or Microsoft Azure to run it, you first you got to transfer data from your company over into where the models are sitting, where the training is happening. And you know what? You're not allowed to do that these days. So many companies, including Broadcom, have put in place uh, checks and balances that says that if any employee hooks up to a, <coughs> to a cloud with generative AI, 
and we start seeing data from the company, any data yes. starting to flow, we'll shut it down. Yes. And we can do that through information security secure, uh, tools that we have. So the bottom line is for enterprise applications, data is what perhaps stops uh, the potential of create, of basically shooting for the stars in terms of trying to create all kinds of applications for generative AI. It's hard. Yeah. So they, you can't get data over. So when you're going to run it on-prem, and if you try to run generative AI on-prem in terms of large language models, LLMs, huge parameters to do all this fan fancy stuff, it costs you a lot of money. And again, your point exactly, Pat, this thing has been, AI has been going on for law for the last 10, 20 years. Right. You know, bank stress test is AI and they run it on CPUs. Right. You know, you put your model in, it run on batch, you go for a cup of coffee, you come back the <laughs> results of that, that's good enough. You don't need to do it in real time. Generative AI gets really large scale to if it's when you want results in real time. And who does that? Social media. Right. Some consumer applications, search engines, most of us, we don't need it. So it will take time to be adopted and like all technologies, it, it, it has, it's been something that's been evolving and I believe will continue to evolve. This is not a disruptive phenomenon. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting though to see how this does proliferate into the enterprise. Because I think we're really in the, you know, we found I guess what you would call that sort of killer app for inference. Because we kind of knew the training you know, has been taking place. And by the way, all this kind of flow of immediate spend is really about training. Every enterprise, every hyperscaler, every company wants to get as much compute as possible to get training these models. But the inference is where you know, we experience this, whether it's right. running your ERPs and CRMs or it's, it's some sort of knowledge base of company insights that helps you know, an employee figure out how to deliver service or helps a customer figure out what product to buy. And so these things will continue to proliferate in really exciting ways, but it is going to be a combination of your proprietary data has to be over here. And there's going to have to be some sort of walled garden that separates you from the kind of open internet consumer experiences that we have, or else every company's competitive advantage goes away because that data is the, so much of the competitive advantage sits there. Worse than that, now there are privacy rules. You cannot send your data out. Yeah. And you shouldn't, <laughs> just in <laughs> case anybody's thinking about it. Right. Um, so something that I learned that was really interesting actually when we were doing some research on Broadcom is that um, I think it's around 75% of the employees of Broadcom are engineers. Yes. And you talk a lot, uh, you know, well you don't actually come out on the record a lot, which is why we love having you here, but <laughs> when you do, you talk and a lot about try. kind of an engineering driven uh, organization and culture. And you know, I'm interested, Hawk, you know, and as we kind of wind down this interview, to talk a little bit about that. Talk about why you've gone the route of having you know, an engineering-led culture. How does that shape the innovation, the product development, um, you know, and a Broadcom's ability to be this durable, sustainable company over the, over the long term? Well, it's actually very simple. And in the word simple is what drives the entire business model of Broadcom. You know, we are a technology company, start first and foremost. And we pick uh, through acquisitions, but some organically, mostly acquisitions, we pick specific areas in technology where we chose to be very successful. And part of the reason we have been successful and been sustained that success within that, uh, within that scope, narrow scope, is simply because, I mean, uh, you know, we are very focused. It's all back down to focus and keeping the business simple. And so from that viewpoint, your technology company, what, what do you drive it? Tech engineers, you know, you don't, and you, when you, and you get the engineers to create the technology, you want to monetize the technology into products, into how you get it deployed in customers. Make it simple. Do not create anything more complicated than that. And the less you have of non-engineers in a technology company, the more likely you're to keep it simple. So that's why we have 75% 75, 75 of workforce engineers, and the other 
making the model, supporting the model as it goes along. And that's, and it's a really a culture of innovation, but more than that, it's about culture of getting the talent. So our 15,000 engineers, roughly out of 20,000 workforce, are among the best engineers in the areas they are in, in the world, bar none. And it's not they don't fall into a lab. One of it is when we acquire leading companies, we inherit some. The rest, we go out and find the talent where they are. And one of the nice things in America is the, a lot of talent from the rest of the world show up in American colleges. Right. And they want to stay in America after they graduate. So we go out and make sure we find the best of the best. And if they don't come to America, we go look for them elsewhere in the world and we set up at least 10, 12 design centers all over the world where they are. And they work in close collaboration with, design, with our design centers in America. And that's what we create as a very globally competitive technology company. Wow, this has been an incredible 30 minutes here, Hawk, and I just want to thank you uh, so much for coming on. And, and what I know that the listeners and the viewers are going to appreciate is, th is the wisdom that, that, that comes out there. And sometimes it, it's one thing to say, oh, we don't agree with some company's approach, right? I look at the results, and the results speak for themselves. And the core focus of value proposition of customers and customers' customers, that may not, that, that's, that's very unique in a world that is focused many times on the flash and the fireworks of what's new. And Broadcom's consistency, its focus on evolution versus revolution, doubling down on engineering and R&D, that 50% increase since 2009 uh, on, on, on R&D. I mean, it, 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 it's working and it continues to work and, and not just in hardware, right? I mean, here we are moving, moving this game into, into software and, and whether it's mainframe braced applications, whether it's uh, cutting edge cybersecurity, uh, and now uh, my hope is with multi-cloud uh, and VMware. So thank you so much uh, for coming on. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Enjoyed being here. Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Everyone, we want to say thank you so much for joining us this year. It's our 2023 opening keynote here at the 6.5 Summit. You just heard from Hock Tan, CEO of Broadcom. Now, we've got three full days ahead, so much more content for you. We hope you'll subscribe. If you don't watch it live, all these sessions are available on demand. Stay tuned with us for Patrick and myself. We're signing off for now. See you soon. Mm -hmm.